In order to rebuild a country, you have to have a ton of strength. And that's what today's guest, Deo Nizonkiza, has. Deo, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, then, for having me here. So we're talking about Village Health Works. First off, if you would just kind of give us a review as to what it does. Village Health Works is a, a grassroots health organization that uh, began in 2006, and we are working in rural Burundi. We started with the health programs, but uh, we integrated other programs with the time, education, agriculture programs, economic development programs for the community, and uh, we also have to think about the people who have no land, how do they survive? So livelihood skills program are so important. Mm. And uh, it's truly a community-owned organization in uh, its degree by, because it was the, uh, the land was donated by the community and this land is the, is the, is the only commodity that uh, people have. Hmm. And they led the foundation. Uh, it's been uh, quite uh, remarkable. And we're going to get to all the things that you do in your organization, but we have to talk about you. There's a Pulitzer Prize winning book about you, The Strength and What Remains. I found their story amazing. Um, Thank you. And, and we have to go over it a little bit because we, we have to understand why you're doing what you're doing and why you're, you're basically giving your entire life back to your country. Uh, you were a, uh, a senior medical student in Burundi when civil war broke out. Yes. And that civil war was one that, uh, it was Rwanda and Burundi together? It started in Burundi in uh, October 1993 and six months after, on April 6, uh, 1994, it spread to Rwanda. And so that whole region got into a messy situation. Well, civil wars are, are never clean, uh, though the civil war here in the United States was horrific. Yeah. But it sounds like the civil war in Burundi was just as, as horrific, if not more. You know, it's... Uh, it's very hard to compare really, you know, wars and the misery, killings are killings, even when you lose the one human life, that is a, a tragedy. But uh, what is different, in my opinion, from uh, other wars you, or civil wars in the United States and, uh, and Burundi, it's, it's how what happened to the people of Burundi, people killing each other, I was neglected, how hardly anyone was talking about it or thinking about stopping it. Why not? That's a good question. I myself keep wondering why a country that has 10 million people went through this horrible war for over 12 years and hardly anyone seemed to have noticed when holy innocent people were being slaughtered in the name of ethnicity. These are people who have the same language, who are neighbors, who uh, share everything. And uh, just as there is so much done in the name of God, in the name of religion, in the name of race, it was in the name of uh, ethnicity. But the real root causes of these uh, killings have to do with nothing but poverty and lack of education. And this is what we have been missing in terms of understanding why, what is happening. And the international community, in my opinion, I didn't intervene because um, uh, I often hear this, uh, there is no economic interest. We have no oil, we have no minerals, and so why would you send someone to stop a war in Burundi? And to me, it's, um, it's lack of imagination because uh, I believe if you believe in the value of human life and uh, of who we are as human beings, we can intervene anywhere regardless of what we are going to get out of this place in terms of material good. And speaking of getting out, that's what you did. You, you got out of, of Burundi during the Civil War itself. I mean, you, if you were a student at the time in medical school, I mean, you were someone who could fight. 
Well, um, two things. One is that uh, when you fight, you must have the strength to do harm or to protect yourself. I didn't have any. What I could do was to run like many people who tried. Unfortunately, many didn't make it. Mm. And uh, the other is, uh, do you, w what do I do? What, what do I gain after that? Uh, I remember growing up, my father asked me to kill a chicken. I, instead, I asked my senior brother, who rushed and grabbed this chicken that was uh, sleeping. And the noise from uh, that very moment made me run away from home. I didn't come back uh, until the next morning. I never, ever like to see anything that is uh, hurting a life, not just uh, a human being. Mm. So I, I, it's not my, my strength. So you were able to get out, and fortunately, you, yes. And you made it with the help of others yes. to New York. Yes. Now, but I understand you didn't know English at the time. I didn't speak English, and you can imagine how painful it was for me to have gone through what I went through, and to find myself in a place where I didn't know anyone where I didn't speak the language, and yet when I had so much to share with people around me who clearly cared, but we couldn't communicate. Couldn't and communicate, but I also understand you didn't have a whole lot of money with you. I arrived here in New York City with only $200. $200? $200 in my pocket. What was very interesting to me was that uh, Th that, that was uh, the biggest amount of money ever had in my life, and I thought that I could uh, put myself up in a hotel for quite a few days. But uh, I didn't know what uh, life was like in terms of expense and, and all that. Let's talk a, a little bit then about your experiences in New York at, at that time. It wasn't good for you. It was, that's a very good uh, uh, question because uh, when I escaped, I thought that uh, I was going to be better off. You know, you see back home uh, during these uh, terrible times, I was constantly running. So I was physically exhausted. Every minute it was about where do I go to next to hide. How do I run away from uh, this dangerous situation? But then when I was here in New York City, I had no one chasing me with a machete or anything. So my mind was revisiting everything, and I was uh, a stranger in a public space. I was uh, in a culture that I didn't know, and uh, I questioned my own survival. It was. Uh, wrenching experience. You lived in a tenement house in, in Harlem? At first, yes. I spent uh, a couple of weeks in, uh, in, uh, in Harlem, which is uh, kind of an abandoned building. In, in an abandoned building, yeah. Yes, and, um, and that was a pretty untenable situation. And they ended up... Uh, because you saw shootings, drug use, <laughs> horrific things there. You, 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 you know, Stain, what I saw during that time made me question everything that I had learned in life. I couldn't believe that I was in the United States of America where people were just moving around, shootings at night, and there was one person who was killed, I believe, in front of the building where I was staying. Or I could hear after this noise from a gun, well, vehicles and police, sirens and the kind of stuff, I, it, was, uh, it was very frightening for me. At some, you know, sometime I thought, am I having nightmares or what is that? And it was so frightening and so difficult for you that you chose to leave there and go live in Central Park. It was, it was very difficult, but I must say, when I moved to Central Park, that was actually a better option. And for the first uh, couple of nights, I felt so relieved 
because here you have this beautiful forest in the, in the, in the center of this big, gigantic city, and it's quiet at night. You know, I had this uh, opportunity to, to see the stars looking up in the, in the sky and, and all that. But that reminded me of my time growing up in rural Burundi, and yet I was isolated. I didn't have anyone around me to talk about the stories that we used to talk at night. Mm -hmm. And that really didn't make a, um, it, it was short, it was very brief, and it was just during that time that I felt mm -hmm. life was not worth living with all this, uh, had all this societal ideation, it was very tough. But something inside made you go and decide to teach yourself English. Yes, that's, that's a cool story. But I, I, I don't, I, you know, it's a tough language. I'm not sure I can teach myself. You, right? You, you, you are not sure. But if you get into a similar situation, where you have no one else but yourself, and you have to fight for your own rights to exist and suffer by, you know, bread or water, you just uh, try. You do everything you can. You will be surprised to see actually how much. You, you, you can learn and quickly by yourself without anyone else. So this is the kind of conditions I were in uh, because I had not know nothing else left. I just uh, decided to go to a bookstore and I grabbed uh, this uh, tiny French English dictionary and I started memorizing all these words. The problem was that no one could understand what the heck I was talking about <laughs> even when uh, I was uh, trying my best. So it was, it was pretty uh, psychological, exhausting, and, uh, and um, uh, depressing situation. Wow. But the success of you uh, since then and, and what has happened, I mean, is amazing. What did you do? You taught yourself English while you were living in Central Park just by going to dictionaries, and then you decided to go knock on the door at Columbia University and said, let me in? <laughs> it, took, it took longer than that. <laughs> uh, I, I did my best because I had no other option left, but uh, I really consider myself one of the luckiest people because uh, here being so isolated and carrying all these uh, tragedies like a luggage everywhere, being so lost, I found wonderful family through this woman, Sharon McKenna, who works at uh, St. Thomas More even today, and uh, talked to Cherry and Nancy Wolf. Uh, Cherry just passed away the sociologist who taught at Brown University for a number of years and in many different public schools um, across the U.S. and mm -hmm. uh, internationally. And Nancy, who is uh, an artist, and they invited me to have uh, dinner. And I went with Sharon, who speaks French, so she was translating. And they saw that uh, uh, they could uh, host me, and that's uh, an act of compassion. So they said, so hey, you know, bring your things out of, out of Central Park and come live with us. They, they, they I, I didn't have much. <laughs> Why did they do that? Did they see something in you, Deo? Did they, did they see that here is, a, here is a young man who has, you know, already contributed tremendously to his society but has more? I, I really cannot tell you why they decided what, you know, to bring me in. But what I can, it was not what they saw in me. What was possible, I think, it was uh, just because of who they are as compassion people, people who saw the struggles, who saw that my life was about to turn into dust, and they felt that they had the obligation, the moral obligation, to get me through at least for a few days. Um, I don't think that they were thinking, what, how do we what is this uh, uh, young man going to, to become? You did pretty well, don't you think? I, I still have a long way to go, but... Uh, well, wait a minute now. You, you went to Columbia. Yes. You got your, your undergraduate degree from Columbia. Yes. You're in the process. You, you've already been to Dartmouth, I think, yes, medical yes, school. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, and you're going to go back and finish that up. Yes, yes, yes. 
But something stopped you along the way. Yes, and, uh, and what stopped me was uh, it's what I'm, I've been doing, the creation of Village Health Works. That's, uh, I'm happy with uh, how things have been going, but we have a long way to go. We have planted a seed, seed of hope. Mm -hmm. We are working with the community members and it's wonderful to see that uh, not only former enemies are collaborators, but uh, have become good friends. You, <clears throat> you chose to start Village Health, Health Works, though, when you were back in Burundi. Was that it? Or what was it? I, basically, what I'm asking you is you had an opportunity to meet Dr. Paul Farmer at yes. Harvard. Yes. Uh, he's he's world-renowned for his work in uh, global public health. How did that meeting take place, and then what did you decide to do from that? Well, I met Paul Farmer when I was at Harvard School of Public Health, and uh, I read this uh, article, the, the, the Good Doctor, that was written by Tracy in 1999. Tracy Kidder. Tracy Kidder. Who wrote the book, uh, what, uh, Strength and What Remains. Uh, yes. And uh, when I read that, everything I was reading about Paul Farmer made me feel, my God, I've been wandering and walking around thinking, who can actually understand the, what life is like outside of this environment in other countries? And he's this man who had spent so many years in Haiti from when he was a student at Harvard Medical School, who knew something could be fixed and something that is wrong. So quite suddenly, after reading all these, I saw that even if I couldn't communicate with him, this is someone who would understand me and I understand how he sees the world. So there was this uh, uh, symposium at Harvard and I went the, to, to the event and I went straight to him and they said, my name is Deo Gracias. I'm from Burundi. I would like to talk to you at some point. And uh, he said, why don't you just talk to me right now? <laughs> and we stayed together that day, from that day, for 24 hours. We became truly not just friends, but brothers. And that kind of long story short, I ended up becoming the godfather of his son. So I learned so much, and I ended up uh, working at Partisan Health, uh, helping the Haitian patients who were being, being brought uh, to Boston for treatment. And uh, though I don't speak Creole, I was able to, to help the patients through my French. Mm. And uh, I told him about Burundi, and I was also learning the uh, partisan health models, community health workers, and all that. And that was really clear that uh, situations, conditions that dehumanize people can be fixed when the right people get together and decide to do something. And that, that, was not, that was not new to me. What was important and wonderful for me was to find someone who was thinking exactly the same way I was thinking. I remember, for example, go, growing up in Burundi. It was not a life in which I would ask myself, what am I going to do tomorrow? You see, you start a school. By the end of the school year, the classroom is half empty because some children died and others dropped out of school to take care of the, their, their siblings or take care of the parents who are dying. What are they dying of? Undiagnosed diseases and some diseases of human misery meaning the diseases that we have been that have been eradicated in the United States, intestinal parasites or malaria, uh, you, you name it. We, we, we don't really know that much what is killing people because they have no access to health care. But if you had oil or minerals or something else, then maybe somebody would care. Uh, unfortunately, yes. Maybe, maybe, but I don't know whether they care for oil or minerals because there are so many people, for example, in the Congo that have been suffering a great deal, same way as the uh, Burundians. And they have, have quite a few minerals in, in Congo. So when was it that you decided, you said to yourself, I'm going to go to Burundi and I'm going to fix 
help fix my country? It, it was not. Um, I decided this in 2005. And uh, why in 2005? For the first time, I went back to Burundi and spent quite some time over there. My mother was sick, was in this hospital called Rumongi Hospital. It's a public hospital. Mm -hmm. I knew that uh, Burundi had suffered a lot, but I had uh, no idea that uh, when patients are sick and taken to the hospital and are unable to pay for substandard care, they are detained. D detained? Incarcerated. They are kept in hospitals until someone is going to bring money to pay for the bills. So that's bills. the model. If you're sick and you can't pay, you have to stay in the hospital, and so other people who are sick can't get in. They can't. They, they who are not released. Who until. thought up that model? That's a good question. So you see often blood on uh, on uh, on. Uh, you know, people, the hands of people, but uh, where is it coming from? There is a policy called user fee policy that uh, uh, is uh, in Burundi and a few countries, I believe. And because Burundi depends on uh, international funding, mm -hmm. there are regulations. So if patients cannot pay, figure out a way. But it's not this policy that asks peak governments to detain people. How much can people pay if, I believe this, this stat is right, 80% of the people of Burundi are living on, on, uh, under the international poverty level already? It, it, it's, a, it's not only that. We are talking back in 2005 that people who, most of them, spent 12 years on the run many were women and children who were coming from internally displaced camps. They had oh, from like refugee camps in Tanzania? Ex exactly. They had even within the country, within the country. Oh, also, oh even in Burundi as well. Internally displaced camp. I see. So where do, where do you get money to pay for, for anything, really? Yeah. So that's a moral issue, it's a moral question. And why would anyone do such a dumb thing? Pretty much, I would like to. It's a, it's it's a, it's it's harder to understand, but uh, that's what uh, uh, bad policies do mm -hmm. to people. So I'm sitting here looking at at you, and I'm hearing all of these different barriers, and yet you're still trying to make a difference, and you are with Village Health Works. I, I, thank you. We are we are trying to, and that's our goal. We have a, a big vision to build a place that has dignity, working with people who have been suffering. Those are the bottom. And our goal is to inspire others to dehumanize these kind of uh, conditions that have been dehumanizing people and to turn them into the ones that favor life. Create a place that has a decency and create a place where people can have the ownership of their uh, project and what they do. How's it going? It is going well, even though we have a long way to go. As I said before, it is so uplifting for me to see how people who killed their relatives and friends are coming together every single day to do volunteer work. How do you do that? How do you, how do you have a gun or a machete or some other kind of instrument of death kill one day and then a few years later your, your acquaintance is working together? The key is to understand why did they kill each other? Why was that country called Burundi so destroyed? There are many answer to that question. It has to do with the, leg the, the, the colonial legacy, but colonialism has been gone for so many years. And then what is the left there? No really quality of education when people have no access at all to high quality care, when parents cannot feed their children because of lack of knowledge how to grow nutritious food when people get sick and still die in the hands of witchcraft doctors. When witchcraft doctors? Yes. 
when, uh, when the conditions are dehumanizing. These are people who would be misled by anyone who cares about anything but himself. And I this. think this is really what has caused all these problems. We see the Hutus and the Tutsis, but these are people who are the same people, same culture, who suffer exactly the same way, who have experienced the joy of sitting down with their children and have a meal together when they have something, and when someone is suffering is sick, they come together. But when really conditions are so bad, the social conditions are so bad, they destroy. Are they willing to let you help? I mean, after all, you're somebody who has a Harvard education, a Columbia education, now a Dartmouth education. You're a world removed from them. I am not. I left Burundi really physically, but I never left um, in my heart because uh, remembering how I grew up myself and remembering the stories, remembering everything that I saw, the bad and the good. So I am still there and I'm here as well because I learned so much. And so knowing that has been crucial for me to sit down with people I knew and ask them just a simple question. You see, we have suffered and we continue to suffer. We have lost so many. What can we do together versus I'm going to fix these problems for you? What can we do together? Are we going to build something? We will all go out and dig and make bricks and carry stones on our own head and lay the foundation. Not only that brought former enemies together, but also gave them the opportunity to see how much good they could do together, how they could really bring decency into their own communities, which had been lost, and how they could create something that is so humane so that that place can have another image, not the story of killing and hatred. We have about 30 seconds left, unfortunately. If, you're, if, if we're coming back together five years from now, and I were to ask you, how have you done? Well, what would you say? I hope that I would say we are on the road of achieving our mission, but that is not something that I, Deo Gracias, alone can do. It's all of us. It really takes a NAMI of compassion people to do good. And once we save a life, and that life can save a family, and that life can save a village, a country, and the world. That is my hope. Training people is key. Making sure people that are healthy and making sure that they understand the values of life and that they are not limited in terms of what they can do anywhere in the world. Deo, thank you very much for, for being with us. It's a real thank pleasure. You. Thank you so much. Deo from Village Health Works. Take care.